Welcome back to the Resistance Broadcast, everybody. I'm John. Thanks for joining us on this Monday as we approach the end of June. And before we know it, Ahsoka will be here. But we're not here to necessarily talk about Ahsoka or Disney+. Plus. But we are here to talk about heroes in Star Wars. One in particular, as you probably guessed by the title, an underrated one, but one of the best. R2-D2. And we'll get to that later in our discussion and with me as always is james and lacy um so we're back on our discussion stuff we did for for our audience out there we made our return after uh 10 days off which felt like a long time it really did uh with our takes on the latest news and the release dates of the movie so if you haven't yet go back and check that out on youtube or your podcast app and then, of course, as well, we had our uh, me and James did our non-spoiler review for Indiana Jones and the Dial of Destiny, also on the audio apps and the channel. And uh, we'll have a spoiler review coming out for when the movie comes out later this week. And go see Indy. Have a good time. Indiana Jones, back. Harrison Ford, one last time. Um, but we're here to talk Star Wars and R2-D2. But before that, we're going to get into Will of the Force. But before I do that, uh, I want to take a look at... Uh, the swag that we ha- that we're rocking here in terms of shirts. I went with an OG Star Wars shirt today, so it's got like the like original poster thing mm-hmm. going. James, I'm thinking that's a Clone War shirt. Yes. Okay. There it is. Season seven, Clone War. So we got animated and the original movie covered, and Lacey looks like another OG Star Wars shirt. It's just a Star Wars logo. Yeah. All right. Right on. Very cool. We are proudly representing the things we love, and we love Star Wars. So, are you guys ready to get back to what we do best? Because we have a segment that we call Will of the Force. I fear nothing for all this, as the Force wills it. Woo! Will of the Force. I'm excited to be back in this segment again because we get some of the best questions uh, in this segment, uh, mostly because they come from patrons. And in this section, we offer up the ability to submit a question to Will the Force every week to our patrons. And how do you become a patron? Well, you just got to go over to uh, patreon.com slash the resistance broadcast and starting at just five bucks a month, you can begin to do things such as submit topics to Will the Force. You can pop in a question. We'll pull from that. And uh, we get, like I said before, we get a lot of the best questions from there, but um but it's 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 am not I, just am I that. Chopped liver, so much that more. Is that, am I chopped liver, James? My my question's not good. The patrons are what I I see what's happening here. We get some of the best questions from patrons. <laughs> yes. <laughs> no, but uh, there's so much more you can do on the Patreon uh, if you want to check it out. But like we said, it starts at five bucks a month, and one of the perks is being able to submit topics. But let's get to some of those patron questions, starting with Commander Danny, because. Uh, Commander Danny wanted to know uh, in the next Star Wars movie, of course, the one with Ray uh, is what she's assuming. Uh, will the m- main villain be Ezra? John, I'm going to start off with you on this one. Do you think that Ezra is going to be the villain of the next Star no, Wars movie? No chance whatsoever. And I, I think the whole like good Jedi turning bad thing, like they need to either stop doing that entirely or put a hold on that for this next series of movies because like we got it with Anakin and then we got it with Ben Solo. It's like, if they do that again, especially with someone like Ezra, I think I would be angry at that decision. So I hope this is not something they're exploring and I have a very difficult time wrapping my head around them, even making that choice. So because I think it would be just uh, for all so many reasons, many of which I just listed. No, absolutely not. Mm-hmm. Lacey, do you think there's a chance that vil- that Ezra could be the villain in any of these movies, but even specifically, as Danny points out, the one with Ray? I want to give Danny kind of a little bit of kudos here because it is an interesting idea. Oh, However, I wasn't trying to dismiss her. I'm sorry. I'm I don't saying. think. No, I don't think you are. I'm just saying from because I'm about to say no to it. So I'm trying to be nice about it, Danny. <laughs> I think it's a great idea and I think it's interesting. My 
leaning towards no is a little different than John's in that the way fans reacted to Luke Skywalker, even having a moment of being a villain in someone's story is enough that they will not do that with Ezra. I don't think they'll ever take a beloved character like Ezra that everyone is like the, he is the character from for some Star Wars fans that they'd get a bad a lot of backlash. Like they're still dealing with the Luke Skywalker stuff. So that is why I'm saying no. And I'm not saying no because it's not an interesting idea. I think it is. I'm saying no based on how fans yeah. have dealt with other k- beloved characters turning bad. Mhm. I think that that ultimately is is the real answer. I I have you know, there is a little bit of um, like when Ezra was pitched as like, what if Ezra is the villain? What if Ezra is Snoke? Right. And it was this thing where I was like, Snoke can't be revealed to be someone that we know from an animated series because the most of the audience would be like, who is Snoke? And then he like pulls off the mask and it's Ezra and everybody would go, who? Like, I don't know who that is. <laughs> Um, and I think that if you're talking about the main villain, I get that there is some quality to, uh, you can, you can make this person, the villain, and it doesn't, it doesn't really affect the major audience because they don't even know who it is, but there would be some connection there. I just, I, I, I don't see how that does the best for Ezra's story is that off screen. He became the villain. If that yeah. makes any sense. And I don't know that it helps. I mean like how Luke Skywalker became the villain off screen, but they showed that that's on screen, I think. Yeah. But when you come into it, he's all that stuff had happened off screen. So like Sam Witwer recently right. was, on a podcast talking about the Luke Skywalker stuff specifically. And he said that he said, you had all this character development and stuff that happened to Luke off screen. So people come back and they're like, wait, what? And it's such a jarring experience that it didn't yeah. give people time to sit with it, I guess. Yeah. So like may- maybe it works in the sense of like people who don't know with Ezra, who Ezra is because they're just going to introduce you to a villain who was like, marooned and then was like became evil and they'll show they'll give you that backstory in the movie or whatever oh. um but i i just don't see it happening um i yeah i, I, yeah, I find I it kind of tricky i don't even think it has to be that complicated i think it's a good question danny and i like that we're discussing it but i think it's a completely insane thing that for them to do if they did it and I think it like watch it would, that's what they end up doing. And we're going to have to go back to this clip. Remember it would it. be, I honestly, <laughs> six, if, 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 six, if two, seven. I'm telling you right now, if that's what they do, they are completely out of ideas and they need to pack it up. Because <laughs> if you can't create a new villain and you're like, I got it. Let's take another beloved Jedi teenager getting into his twenties and becoming an adult and he'll become bad. Brilliant. Love it. Let's do it. <laughs> Awful. That'd the be, oh. the other interesting thing, too, is I think there's a stronger connection with Luke than we're even letting on because, yeah, we get it. That that sort of did happen, but it it definitely didn't happen with Luke. They didn't go that far. And I think of Ezra as sort of a another variation of Luke, considering like his birthday was so close and he's on the exact same path with like, you know, not having family and then needing to find his family and father issues and all sorts of stuff with Canaan and all this. But I feel like they want to tell the same story with Ezra as they did with Luke. I think Dave Filoni has sort of created his own Luke and he wants that character to be over to be able to overcome all of the dark issues, no matter what. So I no. think that is Dave Filoni's look on Ezra. And I don't see him being like, what if we just make this guy? I don't even think it's the villain. Uh, Luke doesn't even cross my mind. It's that Anakin, that was Anakin's whole story for the first six movies. And then the next three movies, it's the, that's the, exactly the whole story of Ben Solo. They're going to do it again. And now with another like, beloved yeah, it's character. like a, mm-hmm. the young like, guy that loses his way. Yeah. Just, just, yeah. Yeah. just get, just, I, I will like, you can mad lib a new villain. That's better than picking Ezra to be a villain. Yeah. If he would have lost his way, he would have lost it in like season four of, Rebels. Can, can and Star Wars didn't. just give us because then there's the oh 
uh, is, is Ezra going to be redeemed? Like, oh, God, I, I do not want to go through that again. Can they just make <laughs> a bad person? Give me a villain. Like, make a villain. Well, speaking of bad person. Speaking of bad villains. Me? No. no. Moff Gideon. Our next oh. question is, will Moff Gideon return in Mandalorian Why would it be you? Wait, hold four? on. Pause. Pause. <laughs> we had to break this down a little bit. Why would it be you? Well, I thought you were joking around. Like, you were trying to, like, joke around. What kind of joke is that? That you're the villain? Well, you know what they say. Uh, you either die a hero <laughs> or you live long <laughs> enough to see yourself become the villain. <laughs> there was too much of a pause there for you yeah, to catch You know what they part. say? I'm like, John, do you know what they say? I forgot. Yeah. <laughs> is it Will Arnett or Will Forte? I don't remember. Anyway. Um, anyway. It's it's <laughs> Will Moff Gideon. That's the Will you're oh, thinking okay. of. Perfect. Will Moff Gideon return for Mandalorian season four. Uh, Lacey, you get to go first on this one. What do you think? I'm torn on this question. And the reason is because I don't think he will. I think he died. But now I know people are like, well, he had a mustache and only the clones <laughs> had mustaches. Right. And I'm going to feel so dumb if I say no. And then exactly that happens in the next season where it's like, well, clearly the mustache, you know, it's kind of like Luke Skywalker thing. And I keep going back to him today. It's just that's what it is uh, with like the salt where it's like, oh, well, you didn't see him move the salt with his foot. Therefore, it's not really him. Like mm. he has a mustache. Therefore, he's a clone. Um, I don't know. I'm going to say no. because <laughs> I just feel like he's played his part in the story. And I, I don't know yet. I haven't really sat with it long enough to decide if i'm happy where that story went because i was so hyped on him season one and the way he came in and knew all those facts about every single person there and like i forget the line now because i just read it the other day and was like oh my god this line's so good and then i forgot it uh the you it have was something. something i want or whatever no it's it's a really kind of like dark dark line of like this is where your story ends or something like this mm. like that like this is where that you're you're it comes to an end and it's so definitive and it's so like, oh, he's going to murder these people and this baby. Um, and it's hard to go from that to what happened in season two. And then even in this season, when he showed back up, I was kind of like, it feels like it's too late. And then he tried to like, I don't know, kind of like stomp with a helmet on. And it didn't feel as menacing as it did in season one where it seemed like he was just kind of a Thrawn character where he was so strong-willed and smart like he was 10 steps ahead of everybody and that's what made him so scary and then it comes to this season he's like got this like jet pack and he's got a spiky helmet and he's like now I have clones and you're like okay but let's go back to the guy that just like knew stuff about these people that like nobody knew like Din Djarin's full name Mm. That to me is scarier when people know stuff that you don't even think they know. Mm. But I'm going to go with he's dead. John, is he dead or is he coming back? I think he's coming back because uh, I need him to come back. I Because <laughs> if he doesn't, it's just another botched Star Wars villain. Like sort of I know alluded. that too. Saying that he's dead, I know that's like I feel the same way. I, I mean... I'll never forget when the, he got cast and I was like, oh my God, because I had just finished. I was very late to Breaking Bad. I had just finished Breaking Bad. And I was like, oh man, that guy who plays Gus Fring is going to be, oh, it's going to be so good. And, and then he shows up and just that very Hannibal Lecter style of low pulse, but just completely conscious and sane, sane evil uh, was very fresh and new righteous and um, what he's doing like everything he's doing is right like that yeah and like yeah very calculated and maybe a little thrawn-esque but much much different and mm -hmm. i i feel like they turned him into a punk the way hux became a punk in tlj um <laughs> he became he became a punk in season two and then i feel like there was a return to form in season three but he showed up too late in the mix for me anyway and for that to end that way i would just it, it's just another whimper uh that a, a new Star Wars villain is unable to reach the Vader slash Palpatine level 
And it's that whole, like, we did an episode a long, long time ago about Star Wars have a villain problem, and they still do. And if he's out now, like, uh, that, so I'd much rather him be smart enough to have employed his clones to do his battles for him while he's somewhere else. If he's dead, that'd be a real disappointment. I don't know where they're going with season four, because now it's really blending into all these other series. But I hope The Mandalorian still has its own path as a show that can hold itself on its own without relying upon Skeleton Crew, Ahsoka, uh, just one other show I'm not even thinking of that ties into this. But it, I, I hope he comes back. So I'm going to say he will just out of hope. You I think Aaliyah Kane was more evil than he was this season. And I almost forgot about her, though. You know, but it's she like, was so evil in that one episode that, like, I feel like her evilness topped anything he did because he I didn't mean, even kill. Um, oh my god, blanking. Paz Vizla. John Fav. Yeah, that mm-hmm. guy. Yeah. She, that guy. <laughs> he didn't even kill him. He had people do it for him. Which is still evil. No, Palpatine. It's style. totally evil. Yeah, but I'm saying like it would have been. I feel more evil if he walked up with like, you know, if he had the dark saber at the time and just killed him he's probably dead yeah, yeah but but like the, the the so serialized tv shows like i grew up watching macgyver with my dad and there was this character <laughs> murdoch who would be like lit on fire fall off cliffs and he'd like come back all the time and be like oh murdoch's back oh i can't wait so i hope it's that type of thing where he's <laughs> like yeah he, this is how he survived it whether it's a clone or he like jumped on a thing a floaty thing like anakin was floating on over the lava i don't know uh but he's probably dead which All I think about is MacGruber. I don't even like when someone says MacGyver. I don't even think of MacGyver. I think of MacGruber. Oh, God, that <laughs> MacGruber. So, so you guys are both going with he's dead. No, I'm saying I am saying he will return because I hope he does. Okay, I'm probably wrong, right. but I need to stick with that to right. to keep my hope alive. All right. Um, I'm I'm gonna say that he will return. Um, because I th- I. I'm thinking of it less as a story and more of like a group of people who are making a show together. And I feel like the cast and the writers and the producers and everybody think of Giancarlo Esposito as part of that formula that makes the show work. And I just can't see them saying, you know, and he's done no press that is like, I, I'm done. That's the that was the end of the character. I'm glad I got to play him. Season three was amazing, you know. And maybe we're still like avoiding spoilers or whatever. But I don't know how long that. I don't goes think he's before. gonna say that though. He wants to keep his job. But what what I'm saying is, if that is the intention that that he knew that, that when he got the script that they were killing off his character, and this was the big reveal, and it's like I didn't get that vibe from the cast or anything. That's like. Those were his final days, you know, he of was, playing that character or anything like that. So, so I just think he's part of the crew and th- th- this was part of the story and we're going to keep telling the story and he's going to reveal th- more about how he's still alive and how he's still part of the story in f- season four. So I, I wrote this question based on IGN asked him about it and he said, I know nothing about season four. Favreau hasn't tipped his hat to me. So many fans are like, you were a clone, right? I could be. I trust John. I know what he's doing. I would love to keep dying and coming back. (laughs) That'd be my favorite thing (laughs) of all. There are a lot of ways to go, and I'm open to whatever they have in play. Now, he, as we know, is a very candid person. He doesn't mind talking about stuff. So I do believe this answer by him. But also, let's not forget that season four was written when they were making season three. So wouldn't you think he would have, Favreau would have talked to him about it? So it's... It's interesting. I don't think he's dead. I don't. Think I think it's dead. a little cheap that they kill him off and then they come back in season four. I'm actually not dead. Like I would, I'd almost have rather have escaped or something. But mm. I have a show um, up with some new burns. Be even more like gnarly looking. Oh yeah, more more um, deformed of some sort. Yeah. Um. All right. He's next more, question. He's more crispy now than man. Twisted and evil. <laughs> Another question from one of our patrons, this one coming from one of our Spice Runners, uh, Indie Dave, Dave. Uh, Spice Runner Dave. Um, Dave wanted to know, in the upcoming Ahsoka series, will Grand Admiral Sloan, Ray Sloan, make her appearance in live action? And if her fleet shows up, will she be 
with or against Thrawn, as it could be a sort of twist and a bit of a civil war between the Imperial factions. This is all pretty interesting. John, you want to take this one first? What do you think? Uh, I think this slipped into a conversation not too long ago for us, but the point blank question, I'm saying no, um, only because I think it's going to be important, especially with all these series trying to come together to have a central villain. And they've been vocally saying Thrawn is a villain. Thrawn is our villain. Thrawn's villain, villain, villain. Uh, I don't like the villain on villain thing. And there's so many stories and characters that they're going to be trying to weave into this thing now, this Mando verse, whatever you want to call it, that throwing another Grand Admiral in the mix seems redundant. And I don't know why they would do it just beyond just doing it. So I'm going to say no. Too, too cluttered, too much going on. And people, including me, I didn't read Aftermath are going to be like, who? Why? We already have Thrawn. Who's this person? I don't care. So I'm saying no. Lacey? Yeah, it's tough. First of all, uh, Dave, hope you're well. The restaurants are doing well. Um, thanks for your question. I understand why as Star Wars fans, we're always really quick to say like, who's going to show up because that's what we've seen in the past, especially with Mandalorian. It's like everybody shows up every other episode. <laughs> <laughs> especially season two was like insane if you think about how many people ended up showing up that season um so i can understand the logic of being like oh will this person show up i don't think she will it's pretty similar to what john said i think there's a lot going on in ahsoka that they have to accomplish and they've already introduced these newer characters uh like the late great ray stevenson's character i i don't see them also introducing this i could see them mentioning her maybe if they want to but i couldn't see her showing up if she does though it's gonna be bananas mm -hmm. um yeah i i think this is tricky because it sort of comes in two parts i don't think that if she does show up with her fleet and all that that she would be some villain against the ron I, I i don't think that's i think that's too much for the show and i don't think that's gonna happen the fact that the character could show up, this is a good opportunity to do it, uh, considering it's a good way to slip in those characters that are elevated mm -hmm. characters. Like, um, like w w there's, there's the thing with like Kaz's dad is showing up, you know, it's like you can put him on the hologram and maybe give him some lines and it's like, Oh, you're elevating another show. This would be elevating the books. The thing that John brought up that is a really good point in my mind is the fact that she's also holding the title of Grand Admiral, and that probably would be pretty confusing. Um, the only thing, oh man, it's tough. She is like involved with the First Order, and that is not who we're dealing with. But it also, they've sort of hinted it See, in season three when you're dealing with uh, Hux and all that that there there are some people who are they have their other praetorian guards and things that they have this other fleet over here and i think that if those guys know about what's going on with first order business then they probably are involved with grand admiral ray sloan too so i don't know it's it's tough it just depends on if they want to go that route explaining more about the first order if they don't and they want to stick to the empire era being thrawn and gideon uh then no so i'm kind of giving both answers it just depends on what which direction they one, go though. in the story if i have to pick one i say no because okay. because there's not really a reason to br bring the character in but if they do go down that first order route explaining more about the setup of the movies then yeah, actually she would be pretty integral and have a big part in that. And it would be a good opportunity to bring in a character like that. Um, but that's going to be it for will the force this week. Um, Lacey, you want to take us into our next section? Yep, guys, it's time for the Patreon pod race. All right, there are lots of ways you can support us. You can like this video, comment, subscribe on YouTube. Uh, you can like us on all the, follow on all the social media platforms at TRB Podcasts. It's all the same on everything now, so it's super easy to find. 
Um, you can also leave a review and follow us on Spotify or Apple Podcasts. It really helps us out to let us know how we're doing and lets other people find us too. So thank you so much for those people that have been leaving reviews. We really, really, really appreciate it. Um, and it's been really awesome to see us ranking, you know, within TV and film on Apple Podcasts because you guys are just sharing the podcast out and watching it and listening. So that's great too. But if you want more than that and you want to be a part of the resistance, you can head over to patreon.com slash resistance broadcast. Starting at just $5 a month, you get to be a part of the community there, a part of everything we do. We do the uh, well of the force questions like earlier. We do poll chats, exclusive videos, live streams, and much, much more. As you go up in the rank, you get more exclusive access. And this is one of those things. So the Patreon pod race for those people that are new is where we let our generals and our space runners take part. We ask them a question, they give their answer, and then we discuss it a little bit. So before we do that, I do want to thank those people. So thank you to our generals, Carmelo, John Reese, Jetta Rosewater, Frank Grande, Darth Hurricane, Nick Kratz, Christian Morales, Brian Smith, Matt Chitty, Danny, Mike Ramori, Matt Heath, Brendan McLaughlin, Count Pepto, Sneaky Zebra, Aaron Ellington, Micah Harrison, Colin Cormer, Jolton, Jedi, DiMaggio, and Diana. Thank you guys so much. And to our Spice Runners, David Probus, Neil Shaw, Kendall Gellner, Ryan... Uh, Dave Warneck, Thomas Hennessy, Andrew Staley, Jeremy Myers, Jeremy Myers, Michael Fry, and Fort Worthian. Thank you. Thank you guys so much. I don't know why I messed that up, but it's all good. <laughs> and this week we have one of our OGs, not just as general, but OG as in someone that's been a part of our Patreon community from like day one. No joke. Yeah. And this is our buddy Mello. How's it going, Mello? We miss you, bud. Um, it was very fun to hear that you guys will watch shortly that your pod race was taking place in Florida because you're now back in the U.S. He's back, baby. He's back. So uh, your question was, what do you hope to see most from a Jedi Master Ray Sky, Sky Skywalker, Skywalker in her return to the big screen? I'm having a rough night tonight. But we're going <laughs> with it. So Mello, take it away. Hello, guys. Hey, greetings from South Florida. John James... Lacey, it's been a while, and I missed you guys so much, and I, I hope you guys are doing great. I think, I, even though I don't talk too much, <clears throat> I see what you guys are doing, and it's always good. I'm really happy uh, what's happening with you guys and your families. I think everything looks fantastic, and I wish you the best, always, every single day. I might not be a verbal, but I'm in spirit. Okay, <clears throat> Ray Skywalker, Master Jedi. You know what I would really like? I want her to be happy. That, that's all I want. I don't want her to be hunched in a corner, sad because something happened. No, no, no. I want her to be successful. I want her to to have her school, to be teaching, um, modify in an improved way of the <laughs> Jedi order or teachings. And uh, I, I'm really tired of the trope that, uh, oh, no, you know, the old mentor is broken and sad and uh, we need to bring him back to or bring her back to to to. to um, to have a happy uh, to to have a, a happy ending. No, 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 no. I prefer <clears throat> right now that Ray is successful and somebody comes. Hey, we have this issue. Can you come help us? She being a a, a good Jedi, a good person. She be like, you know what? That's fine. We need an external foe. We need something else. We don't need to fight depression anymore. Um, I know depression is real, but uh. I think the one the, the, the one of the things that we do for against depression is that uh, we pay too much attention to it, know how we can get out of it. Well, <clears throat> I know that took a turn, and I'm sorry for that, but I just want to say that I think it's time for us to do that. I went too long. I'm so sorry. I love you guys. You guys are one of my favorite uh, podcasts ever, and I wish you the best, always and forever. You are stars. Nice job, Mello. Again, it's great to see you back in the U.S. Hope to see you soon. If you ever come up, you know, New England, let us know. Get some pizza. We did that last time. Anyway, John, what'd you think? I, first of all, I, um, y y I don't know, just, y I get all like emotional hearing from Mello saying these things because he has been with us for so long and he never wavered and he's always supported us like no matter what and that's meant a great deal and uh I, it doesn't matter that you're not always in the chats and stuff mellow like you've always been like this rock for us and 
Mm -hmm. it, when we launched Patreon, you were one of the first four people, I think. So uh, I'm glad that you're you seem to be doing well. I like that you're rocking Grogu back there with you. And um, you look well, buddy, and I miss you, too. Um, and thank you for all the kind words. It like really means a lot. This was really cool. Um, but your as far as your answer to the question goes, uh, I like it. I think it sort of like fits into what I was just saying about how like the thing of turning good guys into bad guys, like you're sort of saying like a similar thing where it's more of like the Luke thing where it's like, oh, I don't want to see Ray like do the Luke thing where she gets mopey and needs to like return. I agree completely. I there is nothing wrong with a Jedi being a Jedi and staying a good person, like good and not getting like down in the dumps. Like Ray can just be an awesome Jedi and that's totally cool. We can find our conflicts in other areas. It doesn't have to be this internal turmoil. Uh, I like that. We've gotten those stories. I like the stories we've gotten, but I'm just saying we don't need to keep seeing that as a pattern. Um, so I, I think that was, you, you gave a really good answer. So I, agree with you and thanks again buddy really appreciate all the support and it's good to see you and yeah like Lacey said it'd be awesome to see you again whether that's in a celebration one day down in florida or another time soon uh but thanks pal mm -hmm. james 100 percent, mellow i i agree with this um i think that it would help a lot to just have her be a beacon of the, sort of the correct way to be a jedi if you will like she gets to start this order and the lucasfilm and the writers and everything have had all this opportunity to see like what they like about obi-wan what they don't like about him what they like about qui-gon what they don't like about him what they like about mace windu what they don't like about him and stuff and they have this opportunity to kind of compile all of these things and just let ray be that thing that could very easily um not only frame her to be uh everybody's new favorite Jedi, you know, like an Ahsoka thing, like people maybe didn't like Ahsoka at the beginning, but they, she's become a great Jedi that people really look up to and one of their favorite characters. I think they have an opportunity with Ray here as well to just really drive that home and say, how awesome is this person? How good or a Jedi is this person? A, a sitcom called everybody loves Ray. <laughs> That's right. Um, so I think, I think we're there and I think they could do it. And I, I think that they should do it, um, because it would not only, uh, bode well for this franchise and let the drama be on, you know, uh, uh, other maybe characters and stuff and the conflict that she has to deal with, but not actually her emotional conflict and what side she wants to choose. Um, but also I think that having that big, positive, strong character, uh, could help the sequel trilogy as well. People be like, man, I really like Ray. Do I need to give those other movies another chance? You know, how do we get here? I want to see how we got to that character because that character's awesome. And I have no problems with her being whiny or her turning to the dark side or something. You know what I mean? I just, I, I think they need to make Ray just like an awesome Jedi. And that's it. Thank you so much for doing the pod race and for being here for so long, man. It means a lot to us. Yeah, Mello, I... I agree with you. I think for me, what stuck out with your answer is that Ray is happy. I think we saw a lot of trauma and sadness and depression with Ray in the sequel trilogy and her dealing with the obstacles of who her parents are, who she's related to, how she's going to find her way, where does she fit in? She has all this pressure on her to save the galaxy and she's just figured it out like basically a year and two days earlier. <laughs> so... I agree that I really think more than anything else, I want to see the character happy. Um, as you guys know, I'm a, I'm a big person that's pushing for her. hopefully she'll have a family of some sort or some type of relationship outside of just being a Jedi. <laughs> I think her character is more important than just being a Jedi. And I think Lucasfilm knows that, but I guess we'll see. Um, but I think it definitely is super important that she's just happy, content, and accepted where she is in her life um despite what challenges face her that she's had time to just be with people that she cares about and i think that's the most important also cheers because i have my old school mug too so oh, cheers yeah. <laughs> this, uh, oh cheers to that almost knocked you Jiggy. look at this oh, oh wow triple cheers yeah <laughs> cheers all right thank you so much and now we're gonna head to john for the discussion all right, it is time for our discussion, R2-D2. The most underrated hero in Star Wars? 
Obi Wan once thought as you do. All right, Star Wars comes with no lack of heroes. Go down the list from Luke Skywalker, Han, and Leia to Obi Wan, Qui Gon, Padme, Ray, Finn, Poe, and more. But R two D two was along for just about all of those people we just mentioned, and all of it, and more often than not, found himself right in the thick of things and always there to bail our more notable favorite heroes out when all hope seemed lost. So let's just talk about R2-D2. We don't have to get too thematic about it. The proof is in the pudding. Uh, Who might very well be the most underrated hero in Star Wars? It very well could be R2-D2. So I just wanted to start by thinking about like the, you know, the, the butterfly effect or chain of events that can happen when, uh certain events transpire in these stories and like for, you know right out of the gate you know you're thinking about the the nubian and r2d2 going up there with all these astromech droids and you know granted in star you know people could say like well a droid is a droid it's not human but in star wars our droids have feelings and they have personalities and they do die and that sort of thing so r2d2 going up there was a brave choice and he was the one who sort of saved them to allow them to go to Tatooine and, and meet Anakin and carry on. But so very early on in star Wars, we got to see R2 be the hero and that carried on. Now I'll say this, as you guys know, I felt R2 was uh, underused in the sequel trilogy and maybe took a bit of a back seat. Now granted, granted at the same time, he still had the missing piece to find Luke so that you can point to that and maybe a couple other things, but mostly throughout uh, the, the main saga specifically and in other areas, R2 always seems to be coming up big when they need him. Like in a high pressure situation, R2 is there to save the day, whether it's to open a door or to stop the garbage mashers or whatever it is. R2 has saved some skins quite a bit. So when we hear, you know, Han tell Luke, you owe me one or now I owe you one. I think everyone owes R2-D2 one. So uh, I just wanted to, I just thought it'd be a nice, fun chat to give some credit and maybe even sprinkle in some Kenny Baker and how R2 was, uh, you know, came to the screen and stuff. But R2-D2, you know, he just, I don't think he gets talked about enough. And I think he can very well be considered the most underrated hero in Star Wars. So what do you guys think about that? I, I definitely, okay. If I'm being totally honest with you, most of the time when people say something like R2-D2 is my favorite character, he's the hero of Star Wars and stuff. I generally do sort of roll my eyes at that. But it's I self-admittedly know that it's unfair because if R2-D2 was a human character, it, there would be no question. You know? Right. Um, it's just one of these things where it's been like, man, that this character, uh, similar to Obi-Wan, that was around in the prequels, then he's around in the sequel, you know, and, and the, the I mean, the sequels is in like the next three, which would be four, five and six. But right. he's in those ones as well. And uh, and he has so many times been involved with the characters that we we forget sometimes the sentience of that character Mm -hmm. and it's not like um you know it's not like the lightsaber or something like is the lightsaber the best hero of star wars it's you know been in all the movies and it took out all these bad guys but it's like it's not just a tool that the the real hero uses um, the sentience of R2-D2 signifies uh, the choice and the loyalty that the character has. And when put in many situations that seem um, un- insurmountable by a droid, uh, even like just being thrown out onto Tatooine, you know, crash landing uh, or, or go negotiate with Jabba and make sure you can sneak into this thing or whatever. They rely on the droid to be able to do that and not as like C-3PO to be like there as a droid, but R2 to be like, but you know the real mission, right? You mm-hmm. know this has to go down and you have to be able to pull this off. Um, so I think um, that what I would like this discussion to be is aimed at the people like me that, you know, maybe don't give R2-D2 enough credit. I don't know. I think I'm on the other side of the equation. I, R2 is one of my favorite characters and I can easily understand why he's a hero in Star Wars. 
like if someone asked me this question, like who are the top five heroes, I would include him in in the list because, I mean, if you look at it this way, away from the original trilogy, because I feel like there's a lot of examples in there, when they brought Star Wars back with the prequel trilogy, like you get introduced to R2 for doing something heroic. He's the only droid yep. that survives to save the ship so that Padme and all the people can get away. So like he gets introduced as like this mighty little droid that saved the day. And it's like, he's constantly saving the day. I mean, one of my favorite moments is, I think my favorite R2-D2 moment is when he's on Jabba's barge, of course, Jabba's palace, Jabba's barge, and he's the bar and he's serving drinks. And R2, C-3PO is like, what are you doing? And he goes, I'm serving drinks. And he goes like, of course you're serving drinks. Yeah. But like, meanwhile, he has a whole plan and like you see him dump the drinks and then he shoots the lightsaber to Luke and like saves the day again. If he never shot that lightsaber, Luke's basically flipping into nothing. And what a toss. <laughs> with no, yeah, with no weapon, no nothing. Um, but I think what makes him an even better hero than just obviously having the ability to hack into systems and being at the right place at the right time is that he always has this sassy, self-righteous attitude that drives whatever he's doing. Mm -hmm. From the moment we get introduced to him in A New Hope, when he's like, I have a mission, I have to go do this. And C-3PO is like, you're an idiot. What are you doing? Like, what's good? And he's like, I'm going to go do this thing. I'm doing it. He's like, peace, bro. Yeah, like he never <laughs> stops and he never for a second questions what's being asked of him. Yeah. And I think that's very heroic behavior that doesn't, necessarily get noticed initially is that when someone's willing to no matter what no matter the risk say yes i'll do it like that's yeah. a hero yeah and i think part of the r2 personality definitely the the sassiness and uh feistiness and maybe a bit foul in you know our assumed responses to 3po but it's also just sort of like he doesn't like care he's the opposite of 3po and that's why they sort of like get along well compliment each other yeah he doesn't care what people think of him in 3po is like obsessed with like making sure like he's so neurotic he's all like, about the process and r2's bureaucracy. like i'm chilling man i'm doing my thing mm -hmm. i got my mission you do what you gotta do i'm rolling up to J the junlin wastes you know you can go wherever you need to go i'll see you later and like but like i don't know if you guys do you guys have a favorite r2 moment where he's being heroic mine is uh, I it's, uh, predictable in Empire when he's helping 3PO get his leg back on and then he goes and he just like he's like wait what's going on oh the hyperdrive oh yeah yeah I'll go fix that and he goes over and like we're all like wondering what's he, what he's doing and he's like yeah yeah oh yeah I'll go fix that I didn't know it needed to be fixed here we go and he just like pokes the thing and the white light comes on and see 3 pos like you did it and they shoot away and then you see like Piet like uh oh god i'm so screwed and vader looking at it and he saves the day there by fixing the hyperdrive when 3po's like chewbacca can fix it don't worry about it he's like no 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 i got this and he goes over <laughs> and just does his little thing with his little tiny hand uh do you guys have a favorite r2 hero moment i already said mine it was the bartending scene in return of the jedi well well all right so your favorite moment <laughs> is him shooting the lightsaber to luke then or being the undercover bartender and oh, then and shooting under... the lightsaber. I didn't see it as undercover because he was assigned to that job by Jabba's yeah, but like he knew he had other intentions though. Oh, I see what you're all right. I got but he did yeah, he didn't like shock Jabba, like I'm not working for you. He was yeah, playing yeah. like okay, yeah, yeah. fine. I'll be yeah. the But he I'm did eventually drink, cut off Leia's leash and everything, so that's pretty mint. Yeah. 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 That's so after he Jedi was exposed. Do you have a particular R2 moment that you're like fist pump? Like, yeah, honestly, I think one of my favorite R2 moments is when essentially he saves Luke in La the last Jedi. Um, I think oh, it was, yeah. I think that moment to me is probably the most human R2 has ever felt to me because it's like he's actually sitting down with his friend and being like, I'm not going to try to convince you, but, and then he proceeds to basically just try to convince him. You know what I mean? <laughs> like, I'm not telling you to come back, man. I'm just Remember telling this? you 
remember all those good times we had, you know, and it's like, I know what you're doing. You know, Luke knew what he was doing. And um, that conversation between the two of them really showcased their history together and how um, he's not just a droid, but he is someone who's been here the whole time. And he's actually having the hard conversation with Luke that says, I don't I don't know what's been going on with you, but we need you, man. You got to come back. You got to fix this. If not for me, if not for her, do it for Leia. Yeah, you know? that's a good moment. Yeah, it's and also like his he's the memory hub of everything like he, you know, restored C-3PO's memories and then Rise of Skywalker. And like I I I. I I still don't like how I think C-3PO in terms of a character uh, usage was redeemed in Rise of Skywalker and he had a really good movie. That was a great 3PO movie. And I think even Anthony Daniels was like, that was my favorite of this new batch. I got to be Mm -hmm. 3PO again and go on the adventures. But I feel like R2 sort of took a backseat in the sequel trilogy. But now we're pointing out there was at least one moment in each of those movies where he did something. Well, it's because they had BB-8. So they didn't I know, need R2-D2. Yeah. And BB-8 has more capabilities and things than, and has like kind of a cutesy personality compared to R2-D2. So Ray's yeah. buddy is, is BB-8. But to James's point, Ryan Johnson did ask for R2-D2 to go to He asked JJ to swap BB-8 out. He wasn't going to take him on the adventure, but he had a really important thing to do with R2-D2. Yeah. Um, yeah, and... Like, some, you know, some of the prequel stuff, you know, I'm not the biggest fan of the <laughs> rocket boosters on R2, but it did afford him to do be able to do a lot more in the prequels and it, it added a dimension to the character. But, you know, thinking about that, that big, you know, scene that had a lot in it in terms of like stress, tension and comedy uh, in the uh, garbage mashers you know, on the Death Star and how... R2 always like seems to have the ability to do these things. He just needs to be told what's going on. And C-3PO has the stupid comm link off. So he doesn't know what's happening. And all it takes is for him to be able to say like, oh, shut them all down. And R2's like, oh, all right. That's all you had to say. I was plug in and shut it down. What's the big deal? Mm-hmm. You know, and it's like that always seems to be the thing with those two. Like one needs the other, but R2 always seems to come up big in that last second. It's like he's the, the saving grace in that last moment. And these movies always have those sort of how are they going to get out of it this time type of situation. And m- more often than not, it seems like R2-D2 is that answer. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It's funny that they send in R2-D2 first in a lot of cases. Um, like I, I tend to think when you think of, um, say, say The Rise of Skywalker, for instance, like C-3PO always seems to be like, catch up. You know, they're like, C-3PO or Empire Strikes Back, they're running into the Falcon and he's like, wait for me. You know, mm-hmm. the droids often get stuck behind. Um, but I'm thinking about a lot of the times, uh, Lacey's example of going to uh, Return of the Jedi, they send him in first. That, that's a good point there. Also, too, just like in The Mandalorian, like who's the first person to walk through those doors? Is it not, is it, is it not R2-D2 first? Am I wrong on that? No, he comes open? in. At, he comes in after Luke. He does I, I come think, in after Luke. Yeah, mm-hmm. Luke oh, man. first reveals. Some reason I was removes his helmet and then R two rolls in after and comes around him wide, and then interacts yeah. with Grogu. Ah, yeah, you might be right. I'm I'm mispicturing that because I was thinking way, yeah. it was Grogu and and R two D two and then he walks through or whatever. Now, well, don't okay. forget well, about the attack on uh, the Battle of Yavin, like. He's strapped in with Luke, who's like this novice kid. And he's like, all right, you're my guy. So I'm going with you. And he gets cooked. And Mm -hmm. but he still does enough to keep Luke in the mix. You know, when he's, you know, an engine's down, R2's fixing stuff. And he's there in this big, like, galaxy changing battle strapped to the back of this X-Wing with this kid who was shooting rats in the desert 15 minutes ago. And he's getting it done. And he winds up being the only... Uh, x-wing besides bigs or uh wedge to survive you know he you, you bear everyone talks about chewy didn't get his medal r2 didn't get his medal either he just got cleaned up and fixed and stuff like that and he finally like teeters up with kenny baker's little rocking back and forth thing and to, to let the audience know that he's okay 
but like R2 should have gotten a magnetic little metal right there because he was a big deal about, uh, you know, big part of that too. And it's like, you think about all these big moments in Star Wars and we list about, you know, the big three in this trilogy and this trilogy and this trilogy. And it's like R2 knew all these people and he saved all of them at one point or another. And it's just like, sometimes I, I think that. Um, and he's the one with Leia at the end. He's the one right. with Leia at the end. And, you know, she she gives him his, you know, when we in terms of like when the movies come out, his first mission that we see him go on, she puts the plans in and he's like, like you were saying, Lacey, like he's like three PO. I get dropped in this desert. I don't care what you're doing. I have a mission. I got to go find this old dude and get him this this stuff at whatever cost. They get snapped, snatched up by the Jawas. Um, you know, he he snaps. You know, they get captured at Jabba's palace and he's like, who the hell are you? And he snaps back at that guy and he says, you're a feisty little one. Like R2 doesn't care who it is. I don't well, care. I if think, it's like- yeah, you definitely see a change with R2 from episode three to episode four, because you have to remember that he followed directions pretty much to a T through the prequels. He wasn't his sassy, like, where are you going? What are you doing? Self necessarily. Yeah. He was a little bit in Revenge of the Sith, but there's this really sad moment that uh in my most re- I I had always like kind of caught it but like it kind of hit harder I think this past time that I watched Revenge of the Sith which was at the end of the movie when he's at Mustafar with Anakin Anakin tells him to stand at stay at the ship mm-hmm. he doesn't go with Anakin and then he never sees Anakin again uh, so oh, I yeah. feel like that yeah. moment was George Lucas being like R2's never going to stay where he's told He's always going to do what he wants to do because the last time he stayed or followed direction, oh, the person he cared about got killed or lost or whatever. Like, because the question stands, would Anakin have done all those things with R2-D2 watching it all happen? And even right before that, when they before they go to Mustafar, where <laughs> I'll never forget this. It was, I think it was actually during our Patreon watch of Revenge of the Sith. I was going to say, I feel like you brought when, this up. This sounds yes, familiar when he's with padme and he's saying goodbye to her c-3po is like why is why the long face r2 what's going on r is basically like dude this guy's lost it like you got to do something you're not paying attention yeah <laughs> like this guy is out of it and, and c-3po is like what's wrong what's why the long face friend and then yeah. anakin's like let's go r2 and r2's not gonna fight with him but you know he was the first one that was really like is anybody else gonna anybody gonna say anything to this guy anybody gonna chime in here and we're gonna stand up for what's going on and it's like everyone was just oblivious or didn't want to see it to the point that you have c3po literally being like what's wrong (laughs) yeah and r2d2 has gotten messed up a bunch of times too like Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. uh what was it it was an empire he accidentally plugs into a power outlet and gets like yeah cooked he got eaten by a creature and spit out that's on dagobah empire yep uh and obviously like shot say, in return of the jedi in a new hope mm-hmm. he gets completely fried yeah i mean he he goes he goes through the ringer and he has all of his memories so all the things you're bringing up lacy and everything you said james and all these examples are bringing up like at the end of the saga i mean i hope we we see him in 3po again in, in like stories after episode me nine. too i hope they but, don't just ditch him but and and i hope they use them more you know you can don't tell me, oh, we. Well, I'm not saying you, Lacey, but don't tell me like JJ. Oh, we have BB-8, so we can't use R2. Like you can. Well, I'm that. saying I think that's why. Not necessarily that that's what I wanted because that was that would never be the case. But no, I think yeah, that yeah, was yeah. the leaning intention. Like even oh, going back to the Ryan Johnson yeah. thing is because BB-8's raised droid. Like that's yeah. her buddy. So, so yeah. yeah, this this makes me wonder who who are C-3PO and R2D2 hanging out with after the rise of Skywalker. I think Chewbacca. Because I think that makes the most sense. Falcon, yeah. They're just... Well, they're, Ray they're had the Falcon up. at the end of Rise of Skywalker and Chewbacca I feel like was they're nice. all like a unit, though. They're all, they all stick together. Like, when we pick back up with Ray, I hope they're all like... Familial. I'm not saying that they aren't together. I'm saying yeah. when we are... If we're literally talking what the end of the movie is, she's by herself with our uh, BB-8. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And and that is interesting because I for although I get it, it's sort of both. Uh, but it's I kind do of amazing that they of, wouldn't do R two droid. 
Right. And I, I'm surprised they didn't do R2 now that we talk about it at the end of Rise of Skywalker, because it would make more sense if he rolled out and then she looked at R2 and was like, is this it? And he just beeps or something because he would know where it is. And, and he also, was there and he'd be there celebrating their passing and stuff. And yeah. And he would have been like, what are you looking at? You know? <laughs> yeah. But no, that's a good point. I think R2 would have been cool in that spot. I, I also, you know, a side note, when you're talking about the Falcon, like, I think it's still Chewie's. I think she just had it and used it to go where she had to go because maybe flying an X-Wing that far isn't sustainable or whatever, but not to get too nervous. Or maybe bullets. Chewie's on the ship. We don't know. They didn't show it. They could have yeah. shot Chewie on the ship. And I'm thinking, like, if and Rey's Chewie, going... Chewie and R2 are both on the ship, just yeah, BB-8 we just don't gets know. out she... with Ray. Yeah, It could be I like, hey, I need a moment type thing, you know? And uh, True. And we'll probably get some sort of book or comic explaining that or showing that. But I think with Ray doing this whole, and this is a little bit of a tangent, but doing the whole rebuild the Jedi Order thing and going full Jedi, um, it wouldn't make sense for her to also own the Falcon, so to speak, and like a Chewie's there. So I, I still think the Falcon will belong with Chewie. And then everyone, they'll, like I like when they go on the adventures on the Falcon, and you could really have these character moments while they're in transport somewhere, just like A New Hope, just like Empire. I think the Falcon is so good and important for storytelling. And if R2 is in the mix in the future, we can get more of him that way too. Hopefully another big hero moment. But I just find this to be an interesting conversation because, James, you made a good point about the sentient element of it because there's plenty of droids in Star Wars that may have sentient nature... Uh, tendencies but don't have like personalities um where r2 is like all personality like 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 from the moment we meet him he's insulting c-3po and people like who had watched sci-fi previously were probably like what is this a droid with a personality just like firing off insults at this other droid who's mad at him and kicking him like we forget how fresh that probably was at the time so right out of the gate we get this personality and this attitude from this droid and then he turns out being this like hero at the end of the movie and then you know an empire and everything he goes through and i'm sure there's a ton of other examples that we haven't brought up like i'm trying to think of attack of the clones he sort of helps padme he helps c-3po when he's uh uh attached to a battle droid in the arena and he's <laughs> and it, it, he doesn't mind going into the line of fire like this isn't a situation where it's a droid like uh, a probe droid like mm -hmm. just doing a thing that's programmed to do. R2 knows he's in danger when he goes in the situ these situations, but he's still mm -hmm. like, I'm doing it because I care about these people. I may make fun of C-3PO, but I do it because he's my best friend and I love mm -hmm. him. And I'm going to go to that right. arena. I'm going to get his head and he's going to say a stupid one liner, but I'm attaching him back to his body. And like, it, we, that's not that, a huge moment, but it's still, he went into this arena that's full of all these B2 battle droids and these Jedi and stuff. And he's like, I'm getting my friend. Like, that's a big hero moment. It's funny, though. <laughs> do you think do you think R2-D2 sees C-3PO as his best friend? Or do you think he sees it as Luke? Because we know that R2 went with Luke to rebuild the Jedi Order as seen in Mandalorian. And we know that he stuck with him the whole time as seen mm -hmm. in The Last Jedi. Of, um, yeah. And so... That whole time, he's separated from C-3PO, assuming C-3PO is with Leia. So it's interesting because I think if he's loyal to anybody, he's been loyal to C-3PO, but I think he j is loyal to C-3PO in the sense of like he's one of the gang. And I don't... Do you think he thinks of him as like his best friend or he's like, yeah. come on, you do? <laughs> yeah. I I get this feeling and I best this might be become from my point of view on the whole Last Jedi thing, but like I really think R2D2 has something with Luke. I think they're they're like connected. In he and sees out. it as a master though, not necessarily a best friend. Cuz yeah. despite being a droid and I don't agree with this what I'm saying is despite being a droid, the droid still sees as master. That's why C-3PO and R2-D2 call Luke their master, starting in A New Hope. And also there's a finite amount of time that Luke's going to be in R2's life, whereas C-3PO was there for a generation before Luke. 
a generation mm-hmm. after Luke. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's this longer stretch of time where they're almost like one comes with the other. And I'm pretty sure, sure they were designed based on old comedy duos. like Laurel Oh, I, yeah, I know all that. Stuff, so I definitely think like if you just walk down the street and you say, who is R2-D2's best friend? They'd be like C-3PO, you know, or whatever. But I'm really I'm trying to understand it from a standpoint of like how Luke and R2 are there together and like r2's there to fight for luke and i don't i don't necessarily just think of him well i think uh, you guys could be right i mean it's just another aspect of it is he he's a droid and he looks up to this person and he says i believe in this person but is it really the programming because i believe if luke told him to do something bad similar to anakin you know what i mean like he might listen but like he's not gonna He's not going to do something bad. You know what I mean? He would he tell would, him no. He, he would yeah. tell him no, or he would fight back, or he would do the opposite, or whatever. Yeah. And so well, I don't like think with that... the restraining bolt, he like he, he tricked Luke because he's like, I, I know what I got to do. I don't, I don't care about this kid right now. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. But, but they, another hero moment that I almost forgot about is R2's with Anakin when he blows up the Trade Federation ship. <laughs> right. Yeah. You know, he helped this little eight year old do what he had to do. Like R2 definitely had a part, a hand in that. You know, so it's like you keep thinking the more and more you think you can really make an extensive list about all these big moments in Star Wars and R2 more often than not is right there in the mix of it. If if not to support a hero to complete something to save people, he's the one doing it. And it's it's just it's just crazy. And I'm not saying like people don't consider R2 a hero like Lacey put him in her top five. He's maybe top three for me. But I think sometimes when people do those hero montages in Star Wars, often they only care about Jedi, yeah, Jedi or Han Solo, or Han Solo yeah, mm-hmm. or Finn now, or you know whoever, uh, and they they won't always go or Chewie. They'll even do you know they'll show Chewie, but I think R two like he should be shown just as much, if not more, than all of them. So I think there needs to be a reevaluation of the value of astromechs but especially one like r2d2 who i think you know there's a ton of astromechs that look just like r2d2 but you know it's like one of those things that they say like there's always that one that's a little different and for 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 star wars specifically uh in this situation it's astromechs and it's r2 is just there's something special about them and and we then you look at him. R5 and you're like, wow, that is night and day. Yeah, or or <laughs> uh, Obi-Wan's uh, R4. R4 or whatever. Like We're just like, oh, it died? Okay, whatever. But if something happened to R2 or if R2 got killed in Star Wars, there would be like fan riots, so to speak. I remember like, going into just- Rise of Skywalker, one episode we did talk about that. And I remember you, John, like you were like, I'd lose it. I'm done. Like if they killed R two D two, I'm out. <laughs> like that was, yeah, killing a character that it was can, that and Chewbacca. You're like I'm I'm nope. if like we had that discussion. Will Star Wars be around in a hundred years? If it is, R two D two can be in it. You know, <laughs> it's yeah. true. So, uh, it's, uh, yeah. it's funny that you're bringing because there are. I mean, R two D two isn't the only one. I mean, like obviously we'd feel the same way about C three PO if we ever had like a death scene with C three PO or something. But there's other ones too, like oh. that are interesting. They've sort of crossed over the choppers and the. Uh, B BD from uh K2SO you know, Fallen Order K2SO well <laughs> yeah but I'm saying like as beloved droids that had seemingly their own personalities and you're That's right true. yeah K- K2SO is is probably the only oh man I'm sure I'm going to get some corrections on this is he the only droid that has elevated to the level where we like we think of this person as one of the crew and one of the main characters and they still killed him off. Uh, he might be the only one. Hmm. Off the top of my head, I can't think of anybody for, for, for droid specifically or just someone who was like a newer addition to Star Wars that got droid. droid droid. Yeah. Yeah, probably. I, I can't think of anybody who's who's like cross the line of like you aren't just a droid. You are part of this team. You are someone we care about. You're Cassian's friend and and you know, you continue to surprise me. He Jin wins him over and all this. There's emotion to that character. 
and they do still kill him off as a droid. That's surprising. It's not as surprising with cheer it and Baze and all, you know, some of the other characters cause characters die, but droids, they usually, if they're, if they get elevated like that, they usually don't kill them off. Like, I don't know when they would ever kill off chopper or BB eight, you know? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I looked up to see for, for hero moments in clone wars. And the, and the one that pops up the most is from a friend in need. Um, and I didn't remember this because I I've only watched I didn't even watched all the Clone Wars, but most of it a, while, a long time ago, except the new season I watched recently. But when he gathered a droid army, um, uh, yeah, it says the Separatists might have thousands of battle droids at their disposal, but those droids are only loyal because they're programmed that way. And uh, R two was forced to repair droids that were damaged in combat and stuff. And he mm -hmm. helped them gather the droid army. So even in beyond the movies, you know, R2-D2 is there being a hero. And uh, you can even say like you brought up the rescue and he, he, he's rolling with Luke into this, you know, dangerous situation. Um, you know, and if he and, was a person, we would just be like, man, Luke and blah, blah are, are if it so was Wedge awesome. Antilles. Yeah, exactly. Yes, exactly. Yeah. 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 But yeah. the problem is, is because it's a droid. We're like, oh, and R2 is there, too. <laughs> you know, I like, know. And what? so uh, do yeah. you have um, any it's other unfair. moments or uh, maybe a, a final thought on the idea of, you know, R2 being a hero? And does he get it, uh, the credit he deserves? Lacey, what do you think? I, so I think when people see R2 and see him on screen and at conventions and see him in merchandise and stuff, people love R2-D2. And I think there are people that are diehard R2-D2 Is that fan. because of the uh, romantic music he plays sometimes when he rolls up on people at these conventions? <laughs> no, that's just me. <laughs> um, but I think overall i think he's a beloved character i don't think he necessarily is always appreciated as the hero that he is right. i think he's seen as a side character but i understand why because you can't have we've said this before everybody be the hero of the story but you can't have someone that's an unsung hero and i think that's what r 2 d 2 is yeah yeah james any uh, other moments to bring up or any final thoughts on uh is r2 getting enough due as one of the biggest heroes in the Star Wars saga saga. I think <laughs> I think that R2-D2 is getting his due, but it's always with a sort of a wink. Like when people, you know, will say like, oh, you know who the real hero of the rebellion is? It's with this tongue in cheek sort of attitude. And, and if someone is like, I'm dead serious, it, it's it's I think it's just because it's hard to like connect for most people with the droid because they are the droid and they're not a human character i think lucasfilm is afraid of that too when it even comes to like aliens and stuff or like star trek they usually don't make their aliens look crazy they usually make them look like humans with some type of thing right um and they want those people to be the the things that people connect with um because it's a little bit more difficult but if you really wanted to like step back and look at that as a character of star Wars, I think you're probably, I think we're onto something that he is un, uh, unjustified hero. You know what I mean? Or not an unjustified hero. What am I trying to say there? Uh, underrated hero. People don't think of him a as much unless you're making that joke list. <clears throat> and I also think because, um, I, I think C-3PO and R2-D2 are a good um, device for kids to follow the story as well. And R2-D2 kind of is like a kid and he bops around like Kenny Baker said he based it on like a dog moving around stuff. Um, like it's showing kids that it's okay like to be brave and like, you know, care about your friends and be brave and, and don't have fear. And, you know, fear is a big part of star Wars and R2D2 seems to never have any of it. Whereas, you know, C3PO does and R2 is almost like there to be like, dude, it's going to be okay. We're going to get through this. It's going to be all right. Like pushing him off of the sail barge and like, you know, all that sort of stuff. So I think that's also a thing too, that just sort of popped into my head. Cause I, I do want to get my son into star Wars or at least introduce him to it in, in a real sense. He's familiar with it and see what he thinks about that because i think through the eyes of kids like seeing r2 and and 3po like 
it might take sometimes you see humans and dialogue and stuff and kids could be like i don't know what this is but if you see these two droids interacting and and doing things maybe that's uh, a way for kids to see like oh you know that if that little piece of metal did this then i you know it's okay for me to try it too my baby likes two characters no three characters chewbacca uh bb8 and grogu and every time she comes into my office, she goes eight eight and has me press the button so that she can. There's hear something BB-8. about those non-human characters that kids register with, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, and BB eight's definitely a new generation, but um, and and it's just maybe... because I have a big BB eight. If it was a big R two D two, she'd be saying R two D two, but right, right. Yeah. And I, I hope, like I said, that you know, with the Ray movie, I, I think you'd have to be crazy to think that we're not going to see R two again. Um, but I hope he gets to be the hero again a bit more. Now he had his moments in the sequel trilogy. We all brought them up, but I think it'd be cool to see R2 get the rise of Skywalker three PO treatment in a future movie, because it's been really fun talking about him in this little 25 minute pocket of time, uh, because we don't really talk about R2 that all that often. So I thought it was really fun to, to revisit that. And I want to know what everybody else thinks, you know, so, um, let us know in the comments or if you're on Patreon and the Discord or email us, Twitter, whatever you prefer. Um, let us know what you think about R2. Is he the most underrated hero in Star Wars? Where do you rank him on, on your list of heroes? And uh, hopefully um, you enjoyed this discussion. So uh, anything else before uh, I take us home? No, no, good. I don't think so. All right. Well, Thank you, everybody, so much for listening and watching and being a part of TRB. Uh, like James said in Will of the Force and Lacey said on Patreon Podrace, uh, sub, tell people about us, rate us, join Patreon if you're able to. Um, we appreciate any and all support, uh, even if it's just I like listening to your show. We really appreciate that very, very much. So uh, we'll be um, back with you on thursday for the mando fan show because we're going to talk about the behind the scenes gallery that's coming out on disney plus about season three of the mandalorian which should be an interesting one so um Mm -hmm. we're glad you're along for the ride with us uh as far as we go you can find me on twitter at johnny hoey and my movie podcast just like the movies uh we should be putting an episode on the raid um which uh some of those guys were in the force awakens so it'd be cool to check that out uh james how about you uh, you can find me on Twitter and Instagram, both at Myra Trunks. Lacey. People can find me on Twitter and Instagram at Lacey Gillard and on TikTok at It's Lacey Gillard. All right. Thank you all so much. And we will see you Thursday or Friday, if you can't make it Thursday, with another episode right here on the Resistance Broadcast. See you around, kids.